Glory to God. As you're joining on, share this broadcast real quick. Everybody invite your followers. Want to deal with something real powerful on here concerning your finances, the money anointing of Jesus. Because that money anointing is so powerful. We see it made the children of Israel come out with their silver and gold. You see, Abraham was very rich in silver and gold. So we see such a massive release of the power of God for wealth and money. And then God went as too far to clarify, I'm going to give you power to get wealth. You imagine, saints, how Jesus loves you so much that he'll give you the power of God for wealth. In his mind, he trying to put more money in your hands, more provision in your hands, more substance in your hands, more increase in your hands. He's saying, I'm going to give you an anointing just for that. You imagine his mindset. So when you say God is good, there's a reason why he's good. And then saints, you know, you ever seen a, a, a father taking care of their child? When you see them taking care of their child, you don't call them wicked. You don't call the child greedy either. You ever seen some a child being taken care of? You don't go stick your face, finger in that child's face and say, hey, you evil. You love money. You love this good treatment. No, you happy to see a child be treated good. Uh, Psalm 1, 2 said, but his delight is in the law. The Lord in his law, he meditates day and night. Then it says that uh, he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of living water that bear forth its fruit in season whose leaf does not wither and whatsoever it does shall prosper or what, whatsoever you do shall prosper. So it's saying that whatsoever you do shall prosper. This is the prosperity of Jesus Christ. And you see his mindset, how he want you to abound with blessings and increase. Let's uh, go to Psalm 115, verse 14. Look what it says. The Lord shall increase you more and more, you and your children. You see the mindset of Jesus. See, Solomon was rich. He's powerful. He's great. But saints, then Jesus came on the scene and says, there's one standing in front of you, front of you that's greater than Solomon. You notice that, right? He's saying that he's greater than Solomon. All right. So if you think about it, Solomon was so rich. Solomon was so wealthy. And all his financial gain was by the Lord. The Lord actually told him in Chronicles, I'm going to give you riches. Which is wild to hear the Lord say, I'm going to give you riches. You, you imagine like the Lord telling him, I'm going to give you plenty of money. I'm going to give you surplus money. I'm going to make you have so much money that, that you, you're not even going to be in needs no more. You're just going to be wealthy. Now, let's go to Matthew chapter 12, verse 42. Look what it say. It says, the queen of the south shall rise up in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it. For she came from the uttermost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And then it says, and behold, a greater than Solomon is here. Now, saints, this is massive. Because if Jesus is saying that he greater than Solomon, that shows you that the wealth and the wisdom on Jesus is going to manifest greater than what you saw in Solomon's life. And St. Solomon was ridiculously rich, shockingly rich. He was so rich that when you looked at him, you wondered, how did he get to this point? How did he get to this realm? How did he get to this, uh, this flow? Because he was exceedingly wealthy. 
Solomon is so rich that the queen of Sheba, she's already living lavishly. But when she sees him, she's shocked. So why is she shocked? Because she rich too. Ha ha you ever thought about that? She is rich too. Huh? She rich too. And at the same token, the riches that Solomon has is blowing her mind. Huh? So you imagine Solomon is carrying a, a extra realm, a extra grace, a higher dimension of wealth and wisdom because she already in wealth. She got wealth. But when she see his, she blown away. So he is lavish and he's a man of God. Now, saints, imagine this. So imagine now Jesus comes on the scene and says, there's one greater than Solomon here. So saints, you imagine Solomon is already great and mighty and riches, but Jesus is saying there's one greater and mightier than him. So since you imagine the wealth, the wealth, the riches, the, the money, the prosperity, the abundance, the wisdom is way stronger on you. Huh? <laughs> the wealth, the wisdom, the abundance, the prosperity, the money, the... All the understanding is greater because Jesus is revealing there's one greater than Solomon here. Now, saints, that's, that's, that's some powerful stuff. That's some powerful stuff because if Jesus is saying, I'm, power, I'm more powerful than Solomon, and you know that Solomon was rich, that means that Jesus is way more higher than him in riches. No, but Jesus is doing this so that you as the body of Christ can realize what you're working with. Because if so what do we know Solomon for? His riches and his wisdom. That's what we know him for. Jesus is saying there's one greater than Solomon. So the riches and the wisdom is at another degree, at a higher demonstration, at a higher release. And that's for you. That's your inheritance. Now, saints, let's go to Proverbs chapter 14, verse 24. Look what it says. The crown of the wise is their riches. The crown of the wise is their riches. Now, saints, this is mind blowing. Because it's telling you that the crown of the, the wise is their riches. So it's saying that if you are a wise person, you're going to be crowned with riches. So money sits on the wise vessel. It's a portal. It's on your head. It's a crown. It's a portal. It's on your head. It says, what does it say right here? The crown of the wise is their riches. Huh? So it's letting you know that when you are a person that makes wise decisions, when you are a person that follows the Holy Spirit directions, money going to sit on you and not no small money, big money, large money. It's powerful, saints. It's powerful. It's powerful. Okay, let me read it again. This is Proverbs chapter 14, verse 24. The crown of the wise is their riches. The crown of the wise is their riches. Now, saints, 
You can't miss this. It's saying right here in the text. That the crown of the wise is their riches. You can't miss that. It's telling you that if you wise and you follow in wisdom, that you're going to have riches over you. And this is the Bible. See, don't listen to what people say. Listen to what the word of God say. Read the word of God for yourself. Let no man be with you. Listen to what Jesus is saying in his holy Bible. Don't look at your bank account to, to try to validify this, this word. It says if you follow in the wisdom of God, riches are going to crown you. Say, I received my crown of riches. Praise God. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. I receive my crown of riches. That means money going to sit on you. Just like the Holy Ghost in Acts. Money going to sit on you. And this is supernatural money. Why? Because it came from supernatural wisdom. Supernatural decision. Supernatural mindset. Now, saints, if you're going to be rich in the Lord, you got to be unselfish because sowing, sowing is an exercise and it's discipline. I know because I'm a sower. And if you get in your feelings, you can't sow the way that the Lord wants you to sow. And oftentimes what you go through in life injure the sowing anointing. What you go through, what happens to you, what you face, it injures your ability to honor, honor and walk in sowing. But you got to fight the good fight of faith. Listen, do you know what fighting the good fight of faith is all about? It's Jesus saying, don't get affected by what you see, feel, or experience in this life. That's what really fighting the good fight of faith is about, if you think about it. To not be affected, to not be offended. To let nothing have a grip on you. If you think about it, that's what fighting the good fight of faith is all about. Not letting nothing bother you. To be unoffended. To be constantly excellent. Fighting the good fight of faith, meaning to master your diligence. To let nothing stop the flow that you at with God. Not being distracted. Not being weakened. Not being seduced by things that come to take away your joy. Now, saints, I want to say this again. It says that Proverbs 14, 24, the crown of the wise man is his riches. It just told you that when you are wise, you're going to be rich. Now, what's the wisdom of God? Sowing. The whole kingdom is based off of sowing. The whole kingdom is based off of giving. The, more, the whole kingdom is based off of increase. The whole kingdom is based off of offering up to God what you have. Look what it say right here in Proverbs chapter uh, 12, verse 24. The hand of the diligent shall bear rule, but the slothful shall be under tribute. You know what that means? That you're in slavery because you don't got diligent hands. Now, saints, this is twofold. It's dealing with working, but it's also dealing with worshiping, which is sowing seed. Taking what you work for and offering up to God. Investing in the gospel. It's showing you that if you're slowful. So, saints, slowfulness is an enemy to sowing. If you take a note, write that down. Slowfulness despises the seed. Slowfulness despises work. Slowfulness hates divine assignments. Slowfulness rebels against prophetic instructions. Saints, this is so powerful because slowfulness is a spirit that makes you run away from anything that the Lord has to say to you. Slowfulness is a spirit that paralyzes the knowledge or paralyzes you from using the knowledge that you have. Ain't that, ain't that, ain't that crazy? Slowfulness will paralyze you 
from using the knowledge that you have. It'll paralyze you. Slopefulness is a friend to your poverty, your sickness, all issues in your body, all issues in your money. You can't become rich the way Jesus wants you to be rich if you're not breaking this spirit of slowfulness. This spirit of slowfulness will slow you down and make you experience trial after trial and run mile after mile and never accomplish nothing. Slowfulness is a demon that loves to see you unhappy, see you depressed, see you discouraged. Now, saints, Jesus created a money system for all sowers, for all those that's honoring God and sowing into their man of God. The person feeding you the word, the person giving you uh, Jesus, the wisdom of the Holy Spirit. They are rich souls sowing to them and keep on sowing into them. Now, let's go right here. Uh, Proverbs chapter 12, verse 27 says this. It says, the slowful man roasteth not that which he took in hunting, but the substance of a diligent man is precious. This is powerful too, saints. Because what this Proverbs is saying, that slowful man, he does not roast what he took in hunting. So watch this. Slowfulness is an unfinished equation. Slowfulness is an unfinished equation. So slowfulness means that you can start off good with God, but you don't finish the task. You leave things undone, which is very dangerous. You start off good. You pit your all into something that the Lord is having you do, but over time you weaken in your passion, your zeal, your perfection of it, your excellency of it, and then the devil robs you of the harvest because you didn't finish. Saints, this is so powerful and this happened to so many people. Starting off excellent and then ended off X'd out. Start off excellent. You are all the way in. You focus. Then Satan used the cares of this life. Stunk, stuff come in your mind. You hear bad reports. You hear wrong voices. And now your momentum, the power of the Holy Spirit is weaned off of you. And then watch this here. You don't understand a distraction is a satanic subtraction. So you being depleted. You losing your value. Mentally, saints, when Satan distracts you, he makes your mind trash. That's why you think all these trashy thoughts. A distraction is where a demon converts your mind into a garbage bin. That's very powerful. How many of y'all caught that? You caught that? You should write that down. I think you should write that down. That's, that would be very massive for your mind. A distraction is where Satan converts your mind into a garbage bin. So he pits all this trash and says negativity is demonic litter. Negativity is demonic litter. So Satan be littering on your mind when you idle, when you're not focused. He litter on your mind. And saints, God can't use you to be wealthy when your mind is littered upon, when he, when he put in trash on your mind, because you're going to take that wealth and it's just going to go back into the satanic kingdom. God can't empower you to carry no large money in your mind, not right? Your mind got to be sound. It got to be... Hearing the sound of the voice of Jesus, it got to be one with the Holy Spirit. You're going to carry well. Other than that, you're going to be messed up. You're going to have issues. Now, saints, let me, tell, let me say this. Why sowing delivers your mind from satanic attacks? Because when you sowing, you got to use your soul. Because sowing is a part of the mind, is a part of the will, and is a part of the emotions. That's why 
uh, the Lord said, I love a cheerful giver. Do you understand this? That's why he said he loveth a cheerful giver because cheerfulness is dealing with your emotions. So he was saying, don't get angry when you're sowing because I love when you get your emotions in the flow of sowing. I love when you get your emotions tied up in the seed that you're sowing. I love when you get emotionally excited. Now, saints, let me just say this. We often talk about we want to please God, please God, please God. But isn't it amazing that the Bible tells us that God loves a cheerful giver, but, but people don't adapt to giving, but they say that they want to please God so much? Well, how are you going to please God if you don't find out what he like and he love? If he said that he love a cheerful giver, how do you care about God's pleasure so much and you want to serve him so much and you so sold out, but you against giving? That means that you don't care about what he loved. Because he just revealed to you in the text what he loved. Through Apostle Paul. And Apostle Paul is a man of God. But the man of God knows because Apostle Paul is sowing. So Apostle Paul is carrying an apostolic governmental mystery. He knows what makes Jesus happy. He knows that the seed. And if God said that he loved a cheerful giver. How could you withhold that in your life? How could you not become a cheerful giver? How could you not sow into? How? You, you, you robbing God of what he loved. How could you not sow into your man of God, your prophet, your teacher of the word, whoever God assigned to you to give you greater wisdom and greater knowledge and inspiration? How could you not sow into them? How could you not support God's vision? Because this is what he told you I love. And not only do I love a giver, but I love when the giver is cheerful. When they, not, when they don't got to be manipulated. When they love doing it. See, saints, let me tell you something. You have a child that does chores or cheerfully does chores. If they do chores, you'll have to keep on telling them. But if they cheerfully do chores, they'll volunteer stuff that you didn't even ask them to do. I'm just giving you an example. Because when they're cheerful, they're inspired to do more. So, so do you understand why the Lord Jesus revealed to us, I love a cheerful giver? Because when you're cheerful, you're inspired to do more. So watch this. You won't settle for 10% giving, which is your tithes. You'll, 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 you'll adapt to Holy Spirit giving, which, Lord, everything I got belong to you. If you ask for over 10%, as a matter of fact, I ain't just going to give you 10%. I'm going to give you offerings. You know what an offering is? That means that I offer it up. God didn't ask me for it. I'm offering it up because my love is so strong for Jesus. Because my fear is so great for Jesus. So I offer it up off of my will. It don't got nothing to do with him asking me for it. See, saints, there are some seeds that I sow out of love, not out of instruction. You sow out of your passion for God, your belief in his ability. What is 2 Corinthians chapter 9? It says God is able to make all grace abound towards you. Verse 8 through 10, God is able to make all grace abound towards you. So imagine when you go before the throne of grace, he's able to make all grace. He able to make all grace abound towards you because you went to the throne of grace. Now he able to make all his grace abound towards you. So now... You don't just receive the grace to be saved. See, saints, what people want to do is they want to talk about a gospel. They just want to say it's the grace to be saved. Well, what about all the other graces? You cheating me. You cheating me. You cheating me. Don't do me like that. Don't, 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 don't just tell me that all Jesus can do is just deliver you from disobedience, but he can't deliver you from debt. 
a bad bank account, not being able to buy no clothes. You got to wear thrift store clothes. Blessed be his name. Praise God for what you got to wear. But blessed be God. You know that the blessing of God is not you wearing no thrift store clothes forever. God going to take you shopping when you're a sower. God going to take you shopping when you're a sower. He going to lavish you because you're in the place where you're sacrificing yourself. You're sacrificing your provision. You're sacrificing what you got in your hands. There's an abundance of tithe to every single time that you sow your way out and you give to God. There's a recompense. There's a reward. Let's go to 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10. It says, we are good stewards of the manifold grace of God. So it is a lie. We just read that scripture. Oh, by grace you are saved. By grace you are saved through faith. The grace of God is not just through for, for delivering you from sin. It's manifold graces. So after you get delivered from sin, you're supposed to step into the money anointing. Why God don't want you to have money? You're not wicked no more. Why he don't want you to be rich? You're not evil no more. Ain't the money supposed to be in your hands? If you are already obeying God now, why wouldn't he want to put riches in your hand? Because then you're going to fund good works. That's what the Bible said, that you'll have an abundance to good works. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 8 and 10, through 10. You'll have an abundance to every good work. Now, saints, let me deal with this real quick. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10 says, the manifold grace of God. So the manifold grace of God means that there's more than one grace. There's different graces. There's different abilities of Jesus Christ. Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 1, you hear Jesus talking about you're going to receive the power to be my witnesses. Acts chapter 2, you see them stepping into tongues, moving into tongues. Acts chapter 3, you see them stepping into healing. Acts chapter 4, you see them stepping into wealth. So hereby you catch the government of God. Don't bypass this. Don't bypass this, this apostolic. Jesus is telling them that they're going to move in it in Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 2. Now they step into tongues. Huh? The Holy Ghost is moving through tongues. The Holy Ghost is moving through giving them mysteries and revelation and a higher level of communicating with God, which is a, a place of conversation, a place where now they're going to hear Jesus at a higher level because they're praying in the spirit. They are unraveling mysteries. So he's going to talk to them. You talking to God when you're praying in the spirit. Acts chapter three, we see them moving in the healing anointing. Remember Peter and John went up to, to the temple for prayer and they saw the man that was lame at the gate called beautiful. See, I'm going to tell you something. This powerful. Satan likes to call your lame place beautiful. Because he don't want you to ever get delivered from being lame. Deception would try to beautify what you're supposed to get out of. So people be broke. And they try to act like I'm holy, I'm righteous, I'm good because I'm broke. I ain't got no money, but I love God with all my heart and mind and soul. If you love God with all your heart, mind and soul, you don't love what God represent. He represent blessing and riches and wealth. That's what, that's what the angels are crying out, the elders crying out in heaven. They're saying that you're worthy to receive riches and blessing. So, so if you love him with all of you, you will love what he loves. But see, if you in deception, 
you going to call the gate. So watch this here. This was a gate, but this was a gate of hell. See, Peter and John are carrying the gate of heaven. In chapter three of Acts, they carrying the gate of heaven. Because this man is in deception. He's at a satanic gate. It's called beautiful. So Satan is making the gate look like it's beautiful, is, is glorious, and it's not. It's not the perfect will of God for this man's life. Peter is carrying the gate of heaven to destroy the gate of hell that's operating on this man's life. And it's called deception. He's lame from birth, but he continues to be lame because of deception. Because he's at a gate that's called beautiful, is labeled beautiful. So when people see him, oh, it's so beautiful. Oh, you're beautiful. I am beautiful, no matter what they say. <laughs> now, look at this. Acts chapter 3. See, your man of God is carrying a gate to you. Saints, you see how I teach you all the time? I'm always on ministering to you. I'm releasing a gate to you. So the gates of hell shall not prevail against you because your man of God will release a gate to you. Now, saints, I'm, I'm a, I want to shock you with this revelation. You notice it was Jesus that spoke to Peter about the gate of hell. Shall not prevail against you. So it was Jesus that revealed to Peter about gates. Not Kevin Gates. Gates. <laughs> So watch what's happening right here. You notice it's Peter that speaks to him because Peter got a revelation of gates. My God. So your man of God released gates to you because it, it got to destroy the gate of hell that's moving in your life. So watch the gate of hell is moving in this man's life in, in, in uh, Acts chapter three. And Peter comes and releases another gate and switches it. Oh, he switched the gate. This man is at a gate where his lame state is beautified according to the devil. But now Peter comes and releases another gate on him. See, that's what happened. That's why God sent an apostle or prophet to you. Because they're releasing another gate. What happened? The woman with Azarephat, her last meal is a satanic gate. That's not a gate that came from God. It's a satanic gate. Huh? So the gate is not opening up the inheritance. The gate is opening up the ignorance. My God. You see that? You see that? So watch this. I want you to see this. Go to Revelation chapter 21. Look at verse 10. Remember chapter 21, 21, 21, 21. Remember that. You remember what I taught you about 21. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God in her light was unto a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone clear as crystal. And it had a wall that was great and high and had 12 gates, and at the gates, 12 angels. What? The, the gates. The gates. So, so these are the gates that the power of the Holy Ghost, these gates, these are the gates that destroy the gates of hell. These gates, it's, it's right there. Revelation chapter 21 the wall was great. It was high. But then it was 12 gates. And, and what's located at the gates? 12 angels. So saints, the gates that Peter is moving in and John is moving in, but more so Peter, these gates are delivering 
this man from the gates of hell. These gates of heaven, that's why thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as is in heaven. These are the gates that you release to the earth when you sowing. When you honoring God financially, you stepping into these gates. Why are they 12 gates? Because they represent God's government, his benefits, his beneficial system. And you recipients of all these 12 gates. All these gates got angels set up to it. Why? Because God want to release the same realm of success and prosperity and goodness that goes on in heaven and health and wholeness and wealth and abundance that goes on in heaven and money that goes on in heaven down here on the earth. So when you sowing, you stepping into the 12 gates, you step, why, why, what did Jesus have? 12 disciples. Because what he had his own government. See, saints, you call them disciples alone. What you got to understand that they were governmental officials. My God. <sighs> saints, do you understand? D these was governmental officials. So, so, so that's why Jesus sent them out two by two. They are part of his government. And when he sent them out two by two, they went casting out devils. Why? Because they're part of the government.